This is Rick Matson from the University of Washington Shoulder and Elbow Service. Let's talk a little bit about the ream and run shoulder replacement. The ream and run is a type of joint replacement that avoids the risks and limitations of an artificial glenoid component. On the top here, you see the right and left shoulders of a patient that had a ream and run on both sides. These are the axillary views. And here are the post-operative axillary views, and you can see that the decentering uh, on this side has been corrected. You can see that the lack of joint space on both of these preoperative x-rays has been managed with the regrowth of new fibrocartilage between the socket and the ball. We like to emphasize that the ream and run is a very special procedure and it's not for every patient, it's not for every surgeon, and it's not for every problem. There are a lot of reasons that a ream and run should not be performed. One is the patient isn't right. The patient prefers a total shoulder because the rehab may be easier or the patient doesn't have the motivation necessary for a ream and run or doesn't quite understand it or is not in good health or some of the other reasons that I've listed here. Another set of reasons not to do a ream and run is that the shoulder isn't right. It's not really a good procedure for inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, chondrolysis, if the rotator cuff isn't working, and so on. And finally, the surgeon may not be right. The surgeon may not be convinced that this is a good procedure. He may not be familiar with it may be unaware of the details of the technique, or may not be willing to closely support the patient during what can be a longer than average recovery. So the Riemann run is an extensively, valid, extensively validated procedure for severe arthritis in shoulders that have an intact rotator cuff and an intact deltoid function. It usually leads to substantial improvement in shoulder comfort and function, and again, the function is not limited by concerns about uh, what may happen to a plastic glenoid component because a plastic glenoid component is not used in this procedure. The risks include persistent pain, infection, loosening, and weakness. So we start out in evaluating the patient by checking to see how stiff the shoulder is, whether they're lacking in forward flexion, lacking in cross-body adduction, lacking in external rotation, or lacking in internal rotation with the arm in abduction. We want to make sure the shoulder is basically strong, looking for the strength of the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the subscapularis. We need to know how uh, the arthritis has affected the shoulder, so we get standardized x-rays. This is an AP in the plane of the scapula. This is an axillary view showing, in this case, posterior decentering of the humeral head on the glenoid. And this is a templating view to judge the size of the stem necessary. <coughs> At surgery, we position the patient in what we call a relaxed beach chair position. We approach the shoulder through a deltopectoral split. We relieve the adhesions that have formed we're very careful to stay on the safe side of the coracoid process, as shown here, rather than on the suicide. We open the shoulder by incising the subscapularis from the lesser tuberosity of the humerus, and we do a 360-degree subscapularis release to restore the normal bounce of the subscapularis. We resect the humeral head at an angle of 45 degrees with the long axis of the shaft, as shown here. <clears throat> We're very careful to preserve all the bone stock. We do not use large reamers that carry the risk of um, notching the inside of the humeral canal. We also are very careful not to use an oversized prosthesis that may run the risk of cracking the uh, humerus as it's inserted. The key to the operation is reshaping the glenoid. We want to avoid this biconcave glenoid that most arthritic shoulders come to the operating room with and instead restore that to a glenoid with a single concavity 
that allows for the possibility of the shoulder to resurface itself with fibrocartilage that nicely distributes the load across the whole joint surface. We do that by removing the articular cartilage that may be remaining at the front aspect of the shoulder, burying down the crest that may exist between the anterior and posterior concavities, and then reaming the glenoid to the desired single concavity. We're very careful to avoid excessive reaming that may remove too much bone, and instead we remove just enough so that we can restore the uh, single concavity. We have the advantage of using special reamers that we can adjust uh, without needing to bother with a guide wire. We can adjust these reamers so that they remove, again, the smallest amount of bone necessary to restore this single concavity. We check our carpentry to make sure that uh, the bone has been smoothed exactly right. We have these little trial components that enable us to make sure that there's no tipping of the trial when we press on one end or the other. This indicates that we've done a good job of smoothing the surface of the bone so that it will fit the ball when we place it in position. <clears throat> we trial different humeral components uh, to make sure that we have the right balance between motion and stability. If there's too much posterior translation, we'll use an anteriorly eccentric humeral head. By that I mean there's more humeral head to the front than to the back. So here you can see with a standard humeral head, the ball still slips a little bit too much to the back of the joint. Here we've used an anteriorly eccentric humeral head to help center the ball in the socket. We fix the humeral component using impaction autografting, using bone that we harvest from the removed humeral head, and we insert the implant down inside the bone, driving that impaction grafted bone inside to get good secure fixation. This enables us to use a relatively thin stem uh, that preserves the mechanical integrity of the humeral bone so that it is not weakened in any way. If the biceps uh, is frayed or injured, we do what we call an inside-out biceps tenodesis, where the tendon is removed from its attachment to the upper end of the glenoid socket, threaded through the arm bone, the humerus, and let out so that when the uh, prosthesis is put in its position, it pins the biceps tendon securely in exactly the right location. Before putting the humeral component into position, we put six secure sutures at the anterior edge of the head cut. We put um, vancomycin antibiotic down inside the canal, and we insert the prosthesis in the impaction grafted canal just to the right height at what we call the berm, as shown here. This keeps us from having the humeral head being too high or too low. <clears throat> It's very important to check and make sure that there's not extra bone at the bottom edge of the humerus, which we call poo corner, or in the back of the joint, uh, which reveals itself when the bone uh, causes the shoulder to lever out, a process that we call open booking. So we're very careful to check poo corner and check to make sure that there's no problem with open booking. At the end of the procedure, we um, repair the subscapularis securely back to those sutures that we placed before. We now have a secure reconstruction. The subscapularis was the only tendon that we cut, so now we have a fully reconstituted shoulder. We check again to make sure that the shoulder moves the way we want and that we have the desired stability. If there is a little bit too much uh, laxity to the shoulder, we can tighten things up doing what's called a rotator interval plication, closing the subscapularis to the supraspinatus as shown here. Uh, we're excited by the fact that most of our patients are able to get excellent range of motion immediately after surgery, as shown by this gentleman the day after his surgery. Uh, we don't use interscaling blocks because we want to make sure that we see the patient moving without the cover of uh, artificial anesthesia. 
Um, we start the patient on exercises, and here's a patient demonstrating those exercises for his shoulder. Here's his preoperative and post ream and run shoulder. He's doing the supine stretch, a stretch and abduction, the sleeper stretch, the forward lean, external rotation isometrics, and uh, active elevation of his shoulder. So there's the ream and run. I think it's a, a remarkable operation that can take a posteriorly decentered biconcave shoulder such as this and restore a nice smooth joint surface. Here you can see that we used an anteriorly eccentric humeral head to balance the head in the in the socket, but everything is now uh, nicely lined up and this is a five-year follow-up, but we can be sure that this is going to last for this particular person. So thanks for your attention. You can find more information about the Riemann Run and other shoulder uh, procedures by clicking on our uh, links here. Thank you.